Greetings, ladies and gentlemen of the internet. This is the Rock and Roll Spot coming at you with the weekly TV roundup. Uh, sorry we're a day late. Uh, well, day later than normal. Sorry we had some got out of my control yesterday. Uh, anywho, moving on to the roundup itself, and starting off with last Friday's episode of Constantine. Uh, the episode opens with a small town preacher bringing snakes in for his next sermon, just as his father had. Uh, during said sermon, the preacher is bitten by one of the snakes, a rattler, and seems to die. However, he then gets up and displays the ability to heal by regrowing a local man's severed leg. While at an art class, Zed has a vision of snakes at her feet and decides to leave, not, but not before being asked out on a, for dinner by the class's model. Uh, back at the cabin, she tells John of her vision and John tells her about the preacher, so they go to check Zed Preacher out. During Upon, when they get there, they, uh, they watch his sermon, and the preacher speaks Enochian, which John is <clears throat> instantly recognizes as the language of angels. Um, meanwhile, Nate, the first person healed by the, by the preacher, kills his doctor during an appointment, and then after leaving, also kills a uh, police officer, and also kind of seems to have devolved somewhat. John and Zed discover the preacher's miracles are taking its toll on the nearby land, and John talks to Manny, his angelic friend, I guess would be the best way to put it, about about the Enochian spoken by uh, the preacher. Uh, Manny translates it and is able to, well, presumably translates it, and which then uh, basically leads John and Zed to another angel who seems to have fallen in a oops I fell down kind of way not a you know banish from the grace of God kind of way John and Zed take the angel whose name is Imogen to an abandoned barn where they find out that she had a feather taken from her while taking a mortal's soul to heaven, the moral in this case being the pre preacher, Zachary. John and Zed go after the feather, each in their own way. Uh, John has a talk with the preacher about it, uh, and is rebuffed, in fact, even at one point repelled by the power of the feather. Uh, John returns to where he and Zed are, sta are camping, and uh, arrives just as Zed is attacked by Nate, uh, whom John kills with a sickle he's he got from uh, the Grim Reaper. Zed goes goes through a well, fakes going through a baptism in order to steal the feather from the preacher. At just as his healed flock uh, attack, uh, John referring to the to them as ghouls, as well as Nate, I might add. Um, John and the preacher hold them off while Zed takes the feather back, feather back to Imogen. Uh, as about the, around the same time that Imogen is having her feather returned to her, uh, the preacher tells John that a few years back he hit someone while he hit a person while hit and killed a person while driving, and just convinced himself he hit a deer, which causes John to realize the truth about Imogen, which she reveals to Manny and. Uh, Zed, she is actually a fallen angel in the cast from God's grace manner of fallen, not oops I fell down kind of fallen. And uh, however, protective spells on the area on the barn uh, prevent her from leaving. So and John tries to defeat her with his magic, but she is too powerful, and so Manny. Takes, him in, takes Zed's place and well, rips out Imogen's heart which uh, John puts in a, seals in a jar for safekeeping uh, later on, Zed gets a phone call from the model of, uh, from the art class reminding her of, of their date as they are, as it's apparently past time uh, she reschedules and we find out that he had ulterior motives in asking her, as there is 
and he is aware of this, a passenger in his car who tells him that she would, who basically has something to do with her. Whether or not this is, this will have anything to do with her mysterious past is anyone's guess. Anywho, moving on to last week's episode of Arrow. Opens with uh, Team Arrow following up on info from their on their boomerang killer from Star Labs when an Argus uh, assault team stops them and calls the situation a strictly Argus matter. Uh, Cisco and Caitlin show up at Felicity's office to pick up a DNA sample from her and also get a look at uh, Ollie and Roy's toys, as it were, as well as the Arrow Cave, as Cisco calls it. The killer attacks an Argus facility while uh, Diggle and Lila are discussing Potential, her potentially sharing information about it, about the incident with John, with Diggle. Um, Ollie and Roy manage to somewhat stop him, but he's not. He is only truly run off after uh, Barry shows up. It turns out that Lila is the prime target of the killer, whom she identifies as one Digger Harkness, a former. Uh, Argus agent turned mercenary and later member of Task Force X who had to be sanitized. Well, killed, simply put. Cisco was able to identify the maker of Digger's boomerangs after Barry reassembles them. And uh, turns out he, that, he, that this per, the maker of the boomerangs was last arrested by now Captain Lance, who tells Barry that the suspect was last arrested for identity theft. Uh, it turns out that this person has uh, that the man they're looking for has connections to the Russian mob and so Barry, Roy, and Ollie go to check him out. They find him and Ollie tortures him to you know, basically just to get a cell, the phone he uses to contact Digger. And he does this despite Barry's objections. Uh, Felicity traces the phone that uh, they were given, but uh, and they manage to track it to a bar. However, when they get there, it turns out that Digger has used the fact that they're tracing his phone to trace the other phone, the other phone, and find and to well find my mother, find Lila, who is currently being kept at the arrow at the well arrow cave. Uh, he attacks, and Lila gets hit in the chest with a boomerang. Uh, Ollie and Barry go after Digger, uh, who reveals that he has hidden five bombs throughout the city. Barry goes after the bombs, while Ollie takes care of Digger. Barry, along with Roy, Felicity, Cisco, and Caitlin, manages to defuse the bombs, as they all have to be defused at once. <coughs> at once, and then as opposed to uh, not one at a time. Ollie and Barry end up taking Digger to the island. Cisco gives Ollie a new suit. Lila agrees to marry Diggle again. And Barry and Ollie try to see which one of them would win in a one-on-one -on -one fight, which we don't see the result. In a flashback, Ollie learns how to, learns at the behest of Amanda Waller, how to torture people. Uh, some amusing little Easter eggs. One, Cisco comments about the uh, Central City team up between Barry and Ollie. At, that Barry and Ollie were in a league of their own. Nice little nod to the Justice League. Um, Lila also makes a comment about sometimes one has to be brave, sometimes one has to be bold. A uh, nod to the. Uh, the DC team of uh, the DC team of comic book of the same t uh, entitled Brave the Bold, which was also the uh, uh, which was also the premise of a uh, recent Batman cartoon. And, whoop, definitely a funnier one of the, of the bunch. Anywho, moving on to this week's episode of Flash, the mid-season finale. In fact. Opens with Barry running alongside Verse Flash throughout Central City. Uh, go back to uh, runs back to a day earlier. 
Barry and Iris exchange Christmas presents. She, he has gotten her a necklace with, which is a replica of her mother's wedding ring, which she lost when they were ten, when the two were ten. Um, after buying Christopher Wells a Christmas present at the mall, Caitlin sees Ronnie. Um, reverse flash attacks Mercury Labs, killing two guards, and however, is unsuccessful in looking for whatever the item he is trying to find. Barry and Professor Wells asked the head of Mercury Labs uh, to borrow their tachyon prototype, which it turns out is what Reverse Flash was looking for, to bait Reverse Flash, but are turned down. Caitlin enlists Cisco's aid in finding Ronnie. Uh, Barry sees Reverse Flash outside his lab and runs after him, seeking up with the beginning of the, of the episode. Reverse Flash basically smacks Barry around like a rag doll. Uh, back at Star Labs, Barry, Joe, Professor Wells formulate a plan to catch Professor Fla or Reverse Flash. Uh, Cisco and Caitlin eventually do find Ronnie, but insist that he isn't Ronnie and in fact does himself Firestorm. Uh, after talk with his dad, Barry admits his feelings to Iris. Uh, Reverse Flash arrives at Star Labs and is briefly held prisoner in a force field but manages to, to escape and viciously beat Professor Wells. Barry shows up and engages Reverse Flash again, only to be saved by, well, Ronnie. Uh, Cisco concludes that Rever having seen Barry and Reverse Flash running together, Barry concludes that Reverse Flash is not the only speedster present the night that Nora Allen was killed, based on the way Barry describes it. Uh, at the end, Professor Wells goes into his little secret room, unveils a mannequin, and as well as a, as well as a, a flash ring on his on his finger, which he uses to inject a reverse flash costume onto the mannequin. He then places the, the tachyon device on its chest and then and says, "Merry Christmas" to it while well, distorting his voice the same way Barry does, which does remind me of a point I missed on from uh, last week's Arrow. A third mannequin is added to the Arrow Cave for whenever Barry happens to show up in town. Uh, now, the big thing here is, as another point in this episode is that uh, Joe and Eddie have a discussion about metahumans and the fact that they do exist. But it begins with Eddie mentioning the fact that Reverse Flash didn't even touch him. Which a mystery could, one of the potential mysteries of this is, of course, who is Reverse Flash. The end of the episode, it. it looking very much like his Professor Wells. However, the fact of him being completely left alone by him kind of makes the case of maybe it's Eddie after it's actually Eddie. Uh, either I, I'm still looking at it as a 50-50 either way. Anywho, moving on to Scorpion. Uh, episode opens with a, uh, an attack on a safe ma manufacturer, which the safe is destroyed after being after the insides photographed. Uh, the team is called in, and the robbers are revealed, or the attackers are revealed to be a gang called the Ghosts. Uh, and it's, it's in fact found that the attack was test was a test concerning how to open a specific type of vault. Uh, Sylvester tells Walter he doesn't think they should. He doesn't think they should be dealing with cases like this, and ends up, but it ends up finding one of the explosives, which blows up on him, uh, sending him to the hospital. At the hospital, the extent of it, the Sylvester's injuries are revealed, including some swelling uh, near, the, near his brain. And Walter's sister, sister Megan becomes the team's eyes and ears there as she's doing her physical therapy at the hospital. While going over a list of banks that uh, use the same kind of vault, Toby and Happy take a minute while uh, to process what's happened to Sylvester. 
while uh, Walter continues to figure things out. A piece of shrapnel is removed from Sylvester's chest, leading the team to find the man who built the explosives. Um, he uh, he tells Gallo that they were for the, the year of the ghosts, as well as how many were made. Twenty. And at the hospital, Sylvester has a seizure due to his injuries. The team realized after a while, the team uh, realized that there were 20 explosives made, 15 used in the attack in the beginning, and then figures out just how what's, what kind of bank would be need, how small a vault would be needed. However, none of those vaults are well small enough to actually. Do it to be of any use, or for only five to be of any use. Uh, but an armored car would be. Uh, around the same time, they find out which armored car is the actual is their target. The car itself gets hit. Uh, the team gets to the scene of the armored car attack. Uh, a few minutes after the ghost left. Uh, and so the team splits up going after the ghosts who are on motorcycles. Happy stops two with, I might add, a fire hydrant. Well done. Well done, Happy. While Walter and Paige go after the leader, who falls to his death after Walter tries to help him help him up from the side of the building. But uh, Sylvester wakes up and in fact Walter uh at basically runs through the scenario with Sylvester about would could Walter have actually helped the leader of the ghost up off the, the edge of the building he couldn't and it turns out that he would have just been pulled down as well after, and he, after the team leaves uh, Sylvester tells Megan that he no longer feels safe at work and Megan tells him that uh, she'll help him get through it also Toby brings Helps him, begins to repay a debt to Sylvester in the form of rebuilding his comic book collection. And at the end of the episode, the team and Gabe are all in uh, Sylve in Sylvester's hospital room reading the comic books that Toby that Toby bought for Sylvester. Um, I really hope that this uh, this whole this thing with. Uh, Megan and Sylvester becoming close becomes a continuing plot point and not just something there that, you know, will pop up here and there but I'd like to see it built upon more, so hopefully at the end, well, hopefully it will be. Alright, moving on to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Opens with uh, Hydra Quinjets attacking the bus uh, on uh, Whitehall's order. Uh, upon evading the attack, May meets with Coulson and San Juan and tells them what's happened, namely that Ward took both Reyna and uh, Sky. Bobby arranges another meeting with her contact in San Juan. Hunter goes along as backup. Uh, Sky is brought to her father by Ward, who claims to not be loyal to Hydra, but honestly just looking to meet her. Uh, he introduces himself to her as Cal and also tells her what happened to her mother. Uh, Bobby informs Colson of Hydra's presence in San Juan after having seen her contact meet with uh, two Hydra operas. And he also, her contact also uh, palms her an address of a local theater where Hydra's basing themselves out of it, and, and which turns out to be directly over uh, part of the chamber, uh, part of the, the underground city. Uh, Sky discovers that she can touch the obelisk with no ill effects. Um, Coulson, May, Bobby, and Hunter attack Hydra's emplacement in uh, San Juan while Fitzsimmons and Tripp plant explosives in the underground city. Uh, Cal gets loose and, uh, and goes after Whitehall, but is beaten to the punch by Coulson, leading to a fight between the two. And fight is being very generous here, as Cal 
beats the holy hell out of Coulson. Uh, Sky manages to stop him, and she and he ends up calling her Daisy before before leaving. Uh, Sky, or as she will after this, or at, at the beginning of the, the later half of the being referred to, Daisy, goes to stop Hydra's drilling, as well as find Raina and the Obelisk, whilst Ward is found by Agent 33. Uh, those, Agent 33 being the brainwashed S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who was working for Whitehall and had, had a, uh, I don't know, basically had a damaged face mask of May on her, stuck on her face. Uh, she, Whitehall, she reveals was her reason for being, and now it seems her and Ward are working together. Uh, Coulson goes after Sky and Reyna. Trip also follows, mainly to disarm the explosives, so that the city doesn't blow up and just and kill Coulson and and Sky. Uh, Mac, still under the city's influence, leads Reyna to a chamber. And then it's quickly, he, Sky soon joins uh, Raina in the chamber, which shortly after seals itself. However, er, uh, Trip gets in after stop, they need to stop the bombs. Coulson runs into Mac and they have another fight. Uh, Raina places the uh, obelisk in the center of the uh, chamber. It opens, revealing crystals inside. Uh, Raina and Sky. Well, the crystals explode, and Raina and Sky are briefly cocooned while Trip ends up with two pieces of the crystals embedded in his chest, uh, causing him to uh, become petrified, just like their most, just like most people who touch the obelisk have been. Sky's cocoon uh, crumbles away, and after she sees Trip, an earthquake ha occurs. Which, I might add, turns Trip into dust. Uh, elsewhere, another obelisk is found glowing, and a man with no eyes, right, no, no eyes, not just blind, but no frickin' eyes, calls uh, makes a call on his cell phone, and he tells woman who answers that there must be someone new, and that he'll take care of it. Okay, now some quick bits of information on things revealed in this episode. One, Sky and her father. First off, her father he is one Calvin Zabo, aka Mr. Hyde. Uh, Zabo basically created various various terms that imbued him with super strength, much like Henry Jekyll did. Uh, he definitely has some uh, anger management issues. Uh, and is fairly resilient to harm. Sky, uh, there's actually one Daisy Johnson, uh, also known as Quake, a... Uh, a shield operative hint, hint, recruited by Nick Fury himself. Uh, well, get comic origin. Uh, whether or not she'll start going by either Quake or Daisy on a regular basis remains to be seen. As for the obelisks, or also known as, the, or as they've been referred to by others, the diviners and the crystals they're in. The crystals are actually Terrigen, mist, terrigen crystals, which, when shattered, uh, emit, uh, give off Terrigen mists, which empower the Inhumans. Uh, anywho, that's it for this week's TV Roundup. Um, next week, we'll actually have a pretty short one, uh, as this w as both Flash and uh, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. had their mid-season finales this week, so that being said, uh, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and like my like the, page, the channel's page on Facebook, but links to the, which are down below. And uh, until next time, 
Live long and rock hard.